who now have played the, uh, playing the national anthem. Will you please listen the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This evening, Council is grateful to have Pastor Fred Lamar, Frederick Lamar, Senior Pastor of Family Missionary Baptist, to pray with us again. Pastor, welcome back to Council. As we bow our heads, God who is our refuge, God who is our strength, God who is a very present help even in times such as these. God, we understand, God, what our calling is to fulfill, to serve this present age. So, God, we pray for this council. We pray for every member of the council. We pray, Lord, for every member of the staff. We pray for every director, God. Give them favor, Lord. That they do their bidding, Father God, to make our city a great place to live and to raise a family. Bless them in all that they do tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Amen. Bless you. Thank, Thank you, you, Pastor. Clerk, please call the roll. Bangston, Barosa D. Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Any person who takes any actions to obstruct or interfere with the conduct of tonight's meeting may be charged with disturbing a lawful meeting pursuant to Columbus City Code 2317.12. Any person who enters those areas of city council chambers reserved for city officials or invited guests may be charged with criminal trespass pursuant to Columbus City Code 2311.21. Can I get a motion to spend for the reading of the journal? Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Are there any corrections or additions to the journal? Seeing none, the journal is approved. This week's communications received by the city clerk's office are listed on the agenda and will be published in the city bulletin. Are there any others to be added? Yes, President Harden, members of council, final recommendations of the 2022 Charter Review Commission were filed on July 9th, 2022, and will be filed within the clerk's general file. A copy is available on council's website under Charter Review Commission. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Are there any resolutions or announcements by council members, starting with Council Member Bankson? Uh, thank you, Council President um, Harden. Tonight I have uh, resolution 0145X-2022. And as I'm making my remarks, I'm going to ask uh, Trent Smith with the Franklinton Board of Trade to come uh, up, as well as Mark Gideon and Miss Patricia Garling with the Franklinton Historical Society. Uh, resolution 0145X-2022 is to celebrate the 225th anniversary of Franklinton's founding. <clears throat> uh, this year's Franklin, Franklinton is celebrating 225 years uh, of its founding. Named in honor of Benjamin Franklin, Franklinton was founded in 1797 by Lucas Sullivan and is the oldest settlement of non-indigenous settlers in central Ohio. Throughout its history, Franklinton has overcome some very difficult times. Uh, the area was heavily impacted by the Great Flood of 1913, which left 20,000 individuals homeless. Uh, but despite the massive setback, Franklinton's residents persevered, which has led to becoming the cultural, vibrant, active community that we know today. Uh, tonight in Chambers, we have Mr. Trent Smith uh, with the Franklinton Board of Trade. And I know that this 
is about Franklin Tennial, but I, you cannot tell Franklinton's story without talking about Trent Smith. And so I want to thank you for all of your work uh, that you're doing uh, in the Franklinton neighborhood uh, throughout these past years. We also have with him Mr. Mark Gideon and Ms. Patricia Garling with the Franklinton Historical Society. Trent, I'll kick it over to you. Thank you very much. Council Pre President Harden, Council Members, Council Member, uh, Council Member Bankston, thank you for this. Um, we are so proud to be here tonight accepting this resolution honoring the 225th birthday of Franklinton, Central Ohio's original settlement where Columbus began. Our past challenges are well known and our current challenges are urgently in front of us, but today we celebrate the good. So many Franklinton small businesses, organizations, and individual stakeholders have collaborated to properly memorialize the occasion for our, two, our neighborhood's 225th birthday, and we are very proud to do so. We do believe Carol Stewart would be proud as well. From podcasts to events and history education opportunities to swagware, we are helping the larger Central Ohio community celebrate with us, so we thank you for this recognition. While we do, stay, we, we do still face many problems yet, yet to correct, <clears throat> sidewalks, alleyways, and lighting under the railroad and highway overpasses are some of our top priorities for capital budgets going forward. And we look forward to working with you to fix them and position Franklin Tim for another 225 years and beyond. So thank you very much for the recognition and we hope that you'll all be able to come down and visit some of the events and happenings that are gonna be taking place throughout the rest of the year to celebrate the Franklin Tennial. Absolutely, and thank, thank you, you again for your leadership, uh, Trent. You know, when I got to Gladden, uh, the very first person that I called to meet with was you. Um, and that's because it goes without saying uh, the impact and the love that you have for the neighborhood. And what I'm so excited about is that uh, neighborhoods like Franklinton are, are finally moving from resiliency to a renaissance. And so, so happy to be a part of it and so happy to celebrate it. Any comments or questions from my colleagues this evening? All right, seeing none, I move for adoption. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Adopt it. Thank you, President Harden. And then just one uh, quick announcement. I wanted to make sure that all our residents know to, that yesterday I had the opportunity to welcome the Ohio Baptist General Convention to Columbus. Uh, they will be here all week uh, celebrating uh, their conference. It is the largest, uh, actually, gathering and conference of African-American churches in the state of Ohio. So excited to have them in our city. So if you see women walking around with nice hats, you know <laughs> that's why, because the, the Baptist folks is in town. So I just wanted to make sure I gave them a shout out and welcome them to the city of Columbus. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Brosa de Padilla. Uh, good evening, Council President. I have one announcement this evening. Um, this Friday at Dodge Recreation Center Pool, Council Member Bankston and I will be hosting the Council's Splash Party. Uh, this is a creative and fun way for us to get out into the community and meet constituents, especially some of our youngest and most important constituents, and a way for us to be in community together. So we hope folks will stop by and say hello between 3 and 5 p.m. this Friday at Dodge Pool. There'll be fun giveaways, there'll be a DJ, some other things. Come see us. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member. Press Pro Tem. Thank you so much, Council President. Quick announcement. Um, my Meet Me at the series, typically the playground, is uh, continuing this week, but we will actually be at the Highland Youth Garden on Wednesday, so a sort of atypical time for my community hours. Um, they are having their festival, um, and I encourage anyone to come out and just enjoy the beautiful, incredible garden, um, but also to stop by and chat with us about issues you might have. That's from uh, 4 to 5.30, Wednesday, July 20th, the Highland Youth Garden is 67 South Highland Avenue, and their festival goes till, I think, at least 7. Um, so you've got lots of time to stop by and enjoy the really incredible treasure over there on the west side. Thank you. Councilmember Dorrance. Councilmember Favor. Thank you, Council President Harden. Uh, tonight we have resolution 148X-2022. At this time, I would invite uh, Monica Sarazella, Director of Policy and Legislative Affairs, and our Adam H. Executive Director, Ms. Martin, to the podium. 0148X-2022 is to designate July as National Minority Health Awareness Month in the City of Columbus. 
and to recognize Adam H. Board of Franklin County for the contributions it has made to mental health awareness and behavioral health care needs. National Minority he Mental Health Care Awareness Month is observed each July to bring awareness to the unique struggles that racial and ethnic minority communities face regarding mental illness in the United States. Adam H. of Franklin County is dedicated to improving the well-being of our community by reducing the incidence of mental health problems and eliminating the abuse of alcohol and other drugs in Franklin County, which have been heightened by the COVID-19 pandemic. As the Health and Human Services Chair, it is incredibly important to me that I bring issues, specifically mental health issues, impacting our minority communities to the forefront, and more importantly, support organizations like Adam H that are fueling and stabilizing our systems of care. This resolution is not, this, excuse me, this resolution not only underscores the important work of Adam H, but it is also illustrates the impact partnerships have when addressing mental health challenges in our community. So with that, I will turn the podium over to you all. All right, thank you, Council Member Favor. Good evening, uh, Council President Hardin and members of Columbus City Council. Um, my name is Monica Serrazuela, and on behalf of our CEO, Erica Clark-Jones, the Adam H. Board of Trustees, and our network of 30-plus community-based providers, um, thank you for this uh, resolution recognizing July as National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, as many of us know, uh, anyone can experience the challenge of a mental illness, regardless of their background. It does not discriminate based on race, gender, socioeconomic status, or identity. However, we know that individuals from marginalized communities have unique barriers from receiving mental health care, including overcoming stigma and the difficulties of finding culturally and linguistically competent services. In our region, one that is growing uh, by both size and diversity every single day, we know that we have to build the capacity of our behavioral health system to address not only the unmet need, but ensure that the system at large is reflective of the community. And at Adam H, we are focused on increasing our investments to providers that provide access to culturally and linguistic comp competent care for our um, BIPOC, LGBTQ+, our youth, our immigrant and refugee communities. Um, we are laser focused on this. Um, and here tonight, I, I'm very excited to have Rochelle Martin, the executive director of NAMI Franklin County, who is just one of our network providers um, who does this work every single day and is dedicated to improving the quality of life uh, for people with mental illness uh, in our community. Good evening, council member, members favors and president Hardin and uh, council members. I just want to to give you NAMI's, um, um, our, our mission statement. We are dedicated to improving the lives of people with mental illness and their loved ones and their families. And we do it through a number of ways. We do it through support, education, referral, advocacy, at no charge to the participant. I would like to give you our program priorities briefly. We educate, raise awareness to reduce stigma and end the silence of mental illness. We improve services that are accessible to all residents of Franklin County. We collaborate with community partners to fill gaps in mental health services. We serve as a resource for families who have a loved one with a mental illness. We bridge the gaps between crisis and clinical services. Lastly, we advocate at the local, state, and national level. Thank you very much for this resolution. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to each and every one of you for the work that you continue to do. Um, in our community, especially as we continue to navigate uh, in, the, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, are there any questions or comments by my colleagues? Well, with that, I move for passage. Thank you. Clerk, please call the roll. Thanks, Den Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Adopted. Thank you, that is all for me, Council President. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Remy. Th 
Thank you very much, Council President Harden. I have one resolution, one announcement this evening. I'd like to invite Lieutenant uh, Kyle Kincaid to the podium and Sergeant Danher, Danher, you can come on up as well. As I introduce Ordinance 150X 2022 to recognize the 38th annual National Night Out and commend its Columbus area sponsors and participants for their dedication to crime prevention and community building. Whereas the 38th Nash annual National Night Out occurring on Tuesday, August 2nd, 2022 is sponsored by the National Association of Town Watch and locally co-sponsored by the Columbus Division of Police. The National Association of Town Watch established National Night Out, America's Night Out Against Crime, in 1984. National Night Out is meant to increase awareness of neighborhood safety and to facilitate local cooperation and support for crime prevention, bolster neighborhood unity, and demonstrate that communities actively participate in the fight against crime. National Night Out brings together residents, law enforcement agencies, civic groups, businesses, neighborhood organizations, community leaders, and local officials to pursue this mission. Celebrating National Night Out once a year enables residents to become more familiar with their neighbors and various resources available to them in securing the safety and prosperity of their communities. The Columbus Division of Police Community Liaison Section is deserving of special recognition and commendation for the work they do to ensure success of this event. National Night Out is only one example of their constant efforts to serve the citizens of Columbus and to strengthen police community partnerships. There now, therefore, be it resolved by the city Council of the City of Columbus this, that this council does hereby recognize the 38th Annual National Night Out and its Columbus area sponsors and participants for their dedication to build a safer, better connected Columbus community. This is really one of my favorite nights of the year. Um, typically, we are in a mission to, uh, it would be a competition to most of you all on the stage here, but we pretty much kick your butts when it comes to uh, hitting up uh, many different organizations, but we try to get out to see as many, my staff and I try to get out to see as many parts of town as we can. And it's just a wonderful night of fellowship to see um, our officers out with the community making, um, you know, building relationships, getting to know one another and, and expressing how we can cooperatively work together. So I appreciate this opportunity to collaborate and wanted to give both Lieutenant Kincaid and Sergeant, if you'd like to say anything, um, give you guys the opportunity to speak tonight on this wonderful event coming up. Sure, I can update council. Um, CLO has been working hard behind the scenes, been in contact with all of our community groups. We've got about 50, right around 50 events planned right now, range from cookouts, ice cream socials, just large community gatherings. Um, so as long as the weather cooperates that night, it's like you said, uh, Councilman Remy, it should be a good night. Um, lots of fun involved. Um, so, Dan, you got anything else you want to add? Just thank you very much for the resolution. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues this evening? <laughs> All right. I have a good driver. All right. Uh, without any further ado, I move for adoption. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor. Remy, President Harden. I also have one announcement this evening. Um, during my tenure on council, I've held discussions with several support organizations, community leaders, and residents of Columbus about the challenges many people with limited English proficiency often face when communicating with the city. It is imperative that everyone have independent access to the city without the, the assistance of a friend, family member, or even a child to provide interpretation services for them. These challenges have surfaced while simply trying to pay a bill, apply for a particular permit, and unfortunately while requesting emergency services, including while calling 911. This is why next Monday, July 25th, I plan to introduce legislation for consideration that will create a new language access policy for the city. The new code will be the next step in implementing a language access plan, which will go live early 2023. To be clear, there will be two items, the language access code, which I will introduce for consideration next Monday, July 25th, 2022, and then the 
the actual language access plan, which will go live in 2023. To finalize the plan, we'll be looking for a language access coordinator who will work closely with city council, the administration, and the Columbus community to de develop and implement the actual language access plan. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact my legislative aide, Jeffrey Carter at jdcarter at columbus.gov or by calling 614-645-3559. Thank you, Council President Harden. That is all I have this evening. See, uh, the city attorney's office, uh, auditor, anything? Uh, at this time, I'd request the uh, removal of uh, ordinance 2029-22 from the consent action of the agenda. Are there any other uh, uh, ordinances by members for removal? Seeing none, may we now have a motion to waive reading of 30-day uh, legislation on tonight's agenda? Please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa, D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Will the clerk now read into the record order numbers of 30 day legislation on tonight's agenda? Economic Development Committee Ordinances 2009, 2014, 2017, 2035, 2044, 2045, 2064, 2067, 2086 2022. Public Service and Transportation Committee Ordinance 2018 2022. Finance Committee, Ordinance 2074-2022. Public Utilities Committee, Ordinances 1446 and 1841-2022. Administration Committee, Ordinance 2076-2022. Rules and Reference Committee, Ordinance 3215-2021. Zoning Committee, Ordinances 1850 1942, 1944, 1956, 1966, 2082, 2093, 2106, 1688, 1907, 1943, 1945, 1955, 1967, 2052, 2101, 2107, and 2111 2022. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The following ordinances appear on our agenda as consent actions. Will the clerk now read those into the record? Resolutions of Expression 149X151, X147, X-2022, Economic Development Committee, Ordinances 1830, 1831, 1834, 1847, 1980, 2015, 2046, 2057-2058, 2096-2131-2022, Technology Committee Ordinances 1775, 1904, 1981 2022. Public Service and Transportation Committee Resolution 112X 2022 and Ordinances 1903, 1930, 1936, 1958, 1997, 2069 2022. Neighborhoods and Immigrant, Refugee, and Migrant Affairs Committee Ordinance 1913 2022. Veterans and Senior Affairs Committee Ordinances 1786, 1787. 2022 Finance Committee, Ordinances 1915, 1991, 2011, 2033, 2059 2022. Recreation and Parks Committee, Resolution 97X 2022, Ordinances 1329, 1330, 2121 2022. Public Utilities Committee, Resolution 141X 2022, Ordinances 1574, 1598, 1625, 1678. 1716, 1802, 1916, 1923, 1962 2022. Building and Zoning Policy Committee, Ordinance 1964 2022. Housing Committee, Ordinances 1816, 1947, 1948, 1950, 1951, 1977, 1982, 1984, 1989, 1993, 1995, 1999, 2001, 2002, 2006, 2008 2022. Health and Human Services Committee, Ordinances 1952, 1963, 1965, 1994 2022. Public Safety Committee, Ordinances 1900 and 1971 2022. Administration Committee, Ordinance 1842-2022. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We have two speakers on the consent portion of the agenda. The first speaker to come before council is Mr. Nate Wilkins. Nate, is uh, Mr. Wilkins here speaking on Ordinance 1816-2022 in the Housing Committee. Nate, welcome back to council.
1612 Arlington Avenue, Mr. Lieutenant George Wilkins. I'm speaking in four, uh, CA 53, 18, 16, 2020. I would be questioning for $240,000. Uh, I guess this place is like the Eastern place, Holmes LLC. I know y'all questioned for $6,000 but I am questioning for $240,000 and 96 cents is because if, we, if we're gonna look at 50 units in an Eastern place somewhere, I mind you, just look at Clonican Village, okay? The crime written and stuff like that. I'm questioning for $240,000 and 96 cents to make sure these 50 units can stay affordable and high tech security. You know, we look all over town in different buildings and different apartment complexes that have violent crimes and killings and things and stuff like that. Eastern places, you know, I don't know exactly where that's at, but I'm assuming that's somewhere around Eastern Place, somewhere at that huge mall and that huge development. That's just not one mall. That's several malls up there with office and retails and all this other stuff. So, again, I would be questioning for $240,000.96. So, again, we just don't want this particular 50 unit to be a haven for crime or prostitution in the area. So like I said again, we want this to be a high tech uh, 50 unit apartment complex where this is going to be. So I would like to have more clear clarification and information on this. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Director. Uh, thank you, President Harder, members of council. Staff will follow up with uh, Mr. Wilkins. Thank you, sir. Uh, and the, the last person to speak on the consent agenda is Mr. Charles Robles speaking against Ordinance 1994-2022. All right, gang. I uh, hope you all are doing well. Um, <clears throat> I got a, a couple things to talk about. Uh, um, so yeah, uh, just an update on that missing guy, uh, Aries Oberlander Hauer. They removed him from the database. Uh, those radicals did, uh, but they still have at least like uh, a couple other people that they're li that they're likely lying about missing, despite all the millions of dollars they uh, get from the government every year. Uh, but um, and then uh, also, I think it's important. Uh, uh, that maybe we should talk about having like victory gardens and stuff with uh, Biden, you know, his genius strategy in Ukraine. He's talked about there being uh, food shortages. So hopefully, you know, millions of people don't starve to death this winter. So, uh, you know, it's still pretty early in the season. So uh, we could easily grow more food globally. So, uh, you know, I hope uh, y'all will, en will encourage people to make gardens and stuff. Um, and then uh, just the power vested in me uh, by Article 18, Section 9 of Ohio Constitution and Charter uh, 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 Article 45. Uh, Y'all uh, tonight still can, uh, by a two-thirds vote, put a charter amendment on the ballot to remove the monster's power uh, the 29 times uh, the uh, uh, Christopher Columbus, uh, his name occurs in the charter. Uh, two members of city council have said that he was a genocider and council in its statements regarding removing uh, the monster statue uh, division machine uh, here at City Hall uh, used the construct of systemic racism. Uh, so I hope you all will consider that. Uh, Flavortown got well, well over the requisite signatures though online uh, and probably not uh, all people here. I think Flavortown would be better than commemorating genocide. Uh, but more to uh, the uh, ordinance at hand, uh, I sent you all data from the UK Health Security Agency at least uh, week 11 through 13. Uh, COVID deaths among the vaccinated in the UK were 90 to 92% of the pop, of the 90 to 92% of the COVID deaths were vaccinated. Uh, well, less than 80% of the UK population was vaccinated at the time, uh, potentially implying, you know, people who were vaccinated, at least during those monitoring periods, were more likely to die from COVID. Uh, so I hope to get a declaration out of you guys tonight recognizing that as a fact or at the next meeting, uh, just because the news report uh, refuses to inform the public about all the data. And then uh, I just want to point out that the Lancet uh, COVID Commission's chair, Jeffrey Sachs, 
uh, now says that uh, COVID was cooked up in a U.S. lab. Most likely he wasn't definite, but that was like over a month ago and the media still won't report it. Um, Rob, former CDC director Robert Redfield uh, said it was cooked up in a lab. Uh, Luc Montagnier, uh, Nobel Prize winning virologist, said it was probably cooked up in the lab. Uh, no intermediate hosts have been found yet, uh, but I'd like to mention that Supposedly, uh, fur and cleavage sites were found in Laotian bats. Uh, it's not clear what you guys have called it, but fur and cleavage sites, except for binding domains, for right. the main differences. Thank so, you yeah, so I hope you all will form a commission to investigate COVID. Thank you, Mr. Robel. Thank you. Program evalu uh, Mr. Robel, thank sure. you. Yeah, sorry, I, j I mean, just it's a serious issue. Thank so you. So, I hope you guys will talk about it. Thanks for your time. Have a good week. I see the assistant uh, health commissioner is here. I think it's really important that with um, when there's misinformation out there, especially around COVID, that we uh, just make sure that we're putting out accurate information. So um, could you uh, state the health, commi health uh, commission and the health department stance on vaccines and, and what we think folks should do around their, their personal health? Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Council President Harden, members of council. Um, it's the position of Columbus Public Health that our community is safer when vaccinated, when fully vaccinated, and when following the regular vaccination schedule as prescribed by the Centers for Disease uh, Control and Prevention. And so we recommend all Columbus residents um, consult their primary care provider, but we do believe that most residents should seek and obtain vaccination as they have done so uh, up to this point within the pandemic. We know that there are variants. Um, that are coming online, but we also know that there are additional um, booster doses that help us fight those um, nasty variants. And so we just encourage everyone in our community to seek vaccination whenever possible. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, sir. Are there any other questions or comments on the consent portion of the agenda? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve? Clerk, please call the roll by voice. Mr. Bankston. Yes, with the exception of Ordinance 1958-2022, from which I am abstaining. Ms. Barosa de Padilla? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes, with the exceptions of 1786 and 1787, on which I'm abstaining. Mr. Dorans? Yes. Ms. Faber? Yes, with the exception of Ordinance 2120 and 1964-2022, from which I'm abstaining. Mr. Remy? Yes. President Harden? Yes. Ordinance are passed with the noted exceptions. Uh, We'll now proceed with the second reading of 30-day table and emergency legislation. The first committee to come before council is the Economic Development Committee. And it's chaired by Council, council Member Bankston. Council Member, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Harden. Tonight in the Economic Development Committee for second reading, first off, we have Ordinance 1277-2022 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into an enterprise zone agreement with Parkside on Pearl, LLC for a tax abatement of 75% for a period of 10 consecutive years in consideration of a total proposed capital investment of approximately $22 million, of which approximately $2,275,797 will be related to the construction of approximately 12,534 square feet of new Class A office space and the creation of 10 new net full-time permanent positions with an estimated annual payroll of approximately $416,000. Uh, before I go any further, Council President, we do have one speaker uh, on this particular ordinance. Mr. Motil, welcome to Council. And I know that you already know the deal, but three minutes, your name and address. Thank you. Joe Motil, 167 West Cook Road, Columbus, Ohio. President Harden, Pro Tem Brown, members of City Council. Out of the seven stories and 75,000 square feet of space of this development, it will include only 780 square feet of retail space that will generate any type of sales tax and 10 new office worker jobs at $20 an hour. There's no mention of Parkside on Pearl LLC provide any health insurance retirement benefits to these employees. These 10 jobs will flood our city coffers with an annual $10,400 of additional city income tax, just so Mr. Wood and his five various LLCs can benefit from a $44,600 a year tax abatement for 10 years in the most risk-free development area of Columbus, the short north. 
Fully 85% of this project is for high-end market rate housing that is being created to house the labor pool of corporate Columbus's upper six-figure income wage earners. But hey, it's Mark Wood, the Pizzuti Company. It, oh, I'm sorry, but hey, if it's Mark Wood, the Pizzuti Company, Casto, Wagon Brenner, Crawford, Hoying, Schiff, Big Lots, Abbott Labs, Cover My Meds, AEP, Huntington Bank, Nationwide Insurance, or Ohio State University, to name only a few, we all know that the city of Columbus owes a great deal to these developers, corporations, and institutions for making the city of Columbus an opportunity city, as Mayor Ginther puts it. More appropriately, this is the Columbus way. So what the hell? What's just one more tax abatement for an overly large, unesthetic structure in a favored luxury real estate developer of the mayor and city council in the risk-free development area of the short north? while the mayor and city council continue to chip away at defunding public education. I mean, who really cares, especially in the short north? There are probably only a handful of children and teenagers that live there and rely on public education, like nobody's gonna notice anyways. That too is the Columbus way. And of course, we need to keep up the image of the short north for all of our out of town conventioners and to protect the investments of councils and the mayor's campaign contributing luxury real estate developers. And as much as y'all talk about the need to, quote, enhance mobility options for people, you ban scooters, and then you underwrote Uber and Lyft only in the short north. Ginther said, quote, I believe that mobility is the great equalizer. But of course, he did not say for whom. If any of these 10, $20 an hour employees need to take a bus between 10 p.m. and 3 a.m., they better have a cell phone and an app for Uber or Lyft because... The city and code will want to keep those that depend on buses out of the area during that time. Housing officials have also successfully kicked seniors out of the Short North's Bollinger Towers. And Short North residents and business owners rather quickly successfully lobbied city officials to crack down on ATVs on their streets while decades of crime continues in other ne neglected neighborhoods. The favored few in the prized neighborhoods have their private opportunity city in mobility enhancement. That's the Columbus way, of course. We know it well. So what's another tax abatement pork chop for another struggling developer who is trying to make ends meet in this risk-free development area? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Motil. Any comments or questions from my colleagues from Mr. Motil? All right, thank you for your uh, testimony. Uh, be before I move for passage, Council President, first, I, I just want to thank uh, all of my colleagues on the dais here who engage with my office as we consider this proposal. Uh, projects like this are, are never easy. However, I believe that the net benefits received via this deal far outweigh the negatives for the following reasons. Uh, the total property tax for the site as it sits today as a vacant parking lot are $366.9 per year, from which Columbus City Schools only receives a whopping $778 annually. When the project is complete based on its proposed value of the investment, the, the project will generate $59,516 per year in property taxes during its abatement period. So that new 25% that will be gained is that increase. Uh, Columbus City Schools will receive an additional $10,357 per year during that 10-year abatement period. On top of the $778, that they currently receive as the property is. Over the next 20 years, Columbus City Schools would receive only $15,560 should nothing be developed on this property. With the development of the commercial office portion of this project, it is estimated that Columbus City Schools will receive an additional $517,857 in property tax payments over that same period of 20 years. Additionally, uh, thanks to some additional joint advocacy from Councilmember Dorns and myself, we were able to negotiate a higher salary commitment from the developer of $20 an hour, increasing the total base annual payroll from $312,000 to $416,000. Uh, the project will bring in vital property tax revenue for our schools and income tax revenue for the city. Uh, and in particular, with this development, I would like... Uh, Director Stevens to talk about our strategy around office uh, in particular. Uh, this was slated to be all residential, but it was at 
uh, the direction of the development part, department that we included office. Can you just talk about why that's so critical for the city and for this project's long-term viability? Thank you, uh, President Hardin, Chair Bankston, members of council. When we're working with developers and, and looking at projects, we're always looking for a mix, of that, not only residential, but also some type of um, job center development that could occur in that. So we worked with this developer, made the request to uh, include a portion of it as office and, and just to make sure we have that balance between not only residential, but some commercial office space that's uh, going to contribute to the revenue of the city, um, as well as opportunities for our residents to work. Thank you, uh, Director. And again, one to, to point out that we advocated uh, hard to make sure that those job wages went up uh, because I think this council believes and we are getting there that we're, someone should be able to work and live in the same neighborhood. And so I want to thank Council Member Dorns again for your leadership in that effort. Uh, if there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, Council President, I move for passage by voice. Clerk, please call the roll by voice. Mr. Bankston? Yes. Ms. Barosa de Padilla? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorans? Yes. Ms. Faber? No. Ms. Doremi? Yes. President Harden? Yes. Or just pass. Thank you. Uh, next in economic development for second reading, we have Ordinance 1824-2022 to authorize the Director of Develop Department of Development to enter into a dual rate job growth incentive agreement with Nullable Inc doing business as aware for a term of up to five consecutive years in consideration of the company's proposed capital investment of $1,200,000, the retention of 60 jobs, and the creation of 151 net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated annual payroll of approximately $22.28 million. Uh, Nullable Inc., more commonly known as AWARE, is a cloud-based data management platform that uses cognitive computing, machine learning, and behavioral analytics to help companies improve their risk management and company-wide collaboration through the analysis of internal digital communication tools such as Outlook, Slack, and Microsoft Teams. The company was founded in 2007 by Jeff Schumann, Matt Huber, and James Tsai, in right here in Columbus, Ohio, and has increased its revenue by over 400% in the past few years. As mentioned earlier, AWARE is proposing to invest a total project cost of approximately $1.2 million in leasehold improvements to relocate and expand its corporate headquarters to accommodate its increased sales growth and consumer demands. With this expansion, the company proposes to enter into a new lease agreement on a vacant office space consisting of approximately 23,576 square feet at 455 South Ludlow Street in the Brewery District. AWARE will retain 60 full-time jobs with an annual payroll of roughly 7.9 million and create 151 net new full-time permanent positions with a cumulative estimated annual payroll of approximately $22.28 million. Uh, tonight, we do have one speaker for this ordinance, Mr. DJ uh, Byron. Uh, please come to the podium. And I apologize if I said that last name wrong, but Burns. And thank you, sir. Welcome to council. And you have three minutes. Please state your name and or any organization you represent. Uh, Don Burns, uh, the Rooster Newsletter, rooster.info, if you all want to subscribe. Uh, I'm here to talk tonight. I, I know how you all operate. I might as well just shout this at the bike, two bike racks that you all got out there to be about as effective. But this is hobgoblin language that we're talking about here, right? Like President Hardin, Councilman Durant, Councilwoman Brown. Last I saw, you guys were using the struggle of Starbucks workers, taking a photo op, pretending that this city is pro-union. And now I got to read this language. I got to wade through it. We're going to give... 35 cents on the dollar to a spyware company whose objective, let's not get it twisted, is to spy on their employees. Now, I don't know if you all ever worked in the tech sector, but let me tell you, it's Hobgoblin City. And this software is going to be used to spy on employees, break any unionization effort, and we're supposed to be the pro city. They got $60 million dollars. From Octo in October, from Goldman, they got $60 million in fundraising last October. They're backed by Goldman Sachs. And we're going to hand them out 
three quarters of a million dollars? Well, you guys have CODA bus, CODA bus riders who can't even sit on a bench right outside, right now. They're sitting on your stairs. 750,000 can't buy a, a better bus stop. It can't buy another bus. We're going to give it to some tech company to spy on their employees. Is that, is that what this city is about? I mean, I know Councilman Remy, he's already bored because he's a Republican, but the rest of you, I mean, Councilman Durand, you're a member of the IBEW. How are they going to look at you if you go into their hall the next time and they say, oh, well, you just gave three quarters of a million dollars to a company to crush unions? I mean, is that what we're about here? I mean, prove me wrong. I would love, I mean, you can read it in the news that I would love for y'all to prove me wrong because you think I'm just some crank off the street, and I am, but I'll take you to parts of Columbus where we don't have golden pillars, where we don't have these golden roofs. I mean, people are struggling, and you're up here talking about giving out handouts to Goldman Sachs back companies? What are y'all doing here, man? I yield my time. Prove me wrong. All right, thank you, Mr. Burns. Uh, before we move on, are there any questions or comments uh, for Mr. Burns from my colleagues? Uh, Councilmember Dorrance. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Banks. And so uh, a lot of folks know that uh, outside of council, I'm a union lawyer and um, had some folks ask, sort of ask about this particular um, uh, piece of legislation early in the week around sort of the, the things that AWARE does. Um, just want to be very clear with folks. Um, labor law is stacked against workers too often, and the National Labor Relations Board, with which regulates private sector unions, has ruled on this particular issue that um, unfortunately, employers can um, monitor their email systems for union activity. So uh, if you are interested in organizing your workplace, uh, you should not use your employer-sponsored email system. Um, in fact, that um, there's a great resource on the Central Ohio Workers um, Worker Center website about best practices for union, organ union organizing your workplace. A organized workplace is a better workplace. Um, so the idea that um, you know, this legislation is allowing some type of activity, um, just want to make sure that folks are aware that that is not best practice and that if you are interested in organizing your workplace and folks in this community should, um, that they should, uh, again, use best efforts and make sure that they're doing this in, in a way in which their campaign is going to be more successful. Uh, because again, we have seen allegations at places like Amazon, places at Starbucks and other places in which employers are monitoring their employee communications that they own. And if you want to be successful in union drive, and I know this council is interested in seeing more unionizing efforts here in central Ohio, um, you know, be smart. Unfortunately, the law may be stacked against you, but that means that you just got to work harder and with folks that know what they're doing. So I just want to make sure that's very clear tonight about um, if folks are watching here and thinking about uh, how they go about organizing the workplace, check out that guide and the, the central Ohio workers center to really understand how to go about doing that. Any additional comments from my colleagues? Uh, and, and thank you, Council Member, <laughs> Council Member Dorns. I think that we had a very pointed conversation. I want to also want to thank you for reaching out to my office around this. And the conversation really stemmed around what's the end user using? And if that end user is abusing the software, we take that issue up with the end user, similar to social media and so many other things in technology that are, that are misused, right, from what they're supposed to be used for. Um, and so. To echo those sentiments, you know, to my colleagues, AWARE has assured us that their software is not meant to be used to inhibit the creation of a union, uh, and they do not market their software and its capabilities in that way. Tonight, what we are voting on is whether we believe that the investment and expansion of this locally funded, locally founded, homegrown company justifies a job growth incentive, and I believe that the answer is yes. Uh, I've mentioned it before, and I'll mention it again. Economic development is about our people. So when I see 151 new jobs that all pay over $100,000 a year, what I see is 151 individuals, 151 families that can afford to work, live, and thrive in our city. Uh, so if there are no further questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. And for the next uh, ordinance, I will pass it over to Vice Chair Remy. Thank you very much, Chair Bankston. Tonight, I have Ordinance 1851-2022 to authorize and direct the City Auditor to transfer an amount not to exceed $10,605,766.47 within the General Fund to authorize and direct the City Auditor to appropriate and transfer $2,651,000. 
$651,441.62 in cash from the Special Income Tax Fund to the General Fund to authorize and direct the City Auditor to make payments, not to exceed a total of $10,605,766.47 in accordance with the Jobs Growth Incentive Program for the 16 active and reporting JGI agreements for which employers have met the requirements of the, their JGI agreements and thus are eligible to receive their payments for tax year 2021 also calendar year and or report year in 2022 to authorize the expenditure not to exceed $10,605,766.47 from the general fund and to declare an emergency. The 16 agreements with the JGI payment subtotals are as follows, $332,741.69 to cover my meds, $1,325,610.47 to the Huntington Bank, $4,304.97 to install building products, $13,193.08 to Corson. Corson Fire and Security, $63,124.58 to Morgan Stanley Domestic Holdings. Doing businesses, Morgan Stanley, $1,502,563.31 to Nationwide Children's Hospital, $32,068.37 to Northwest Bank, $2,742.77 to Ofer Health. D doing business as Smile MD, six million five hundred sixty-three thousand eight hundred seventy-one dollars and fifty-five cents to the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center, fifty-two thousand seven two hundred seventy-two dollars and ninety-three cents to Ohio Health Corporation, nine hundred fifty-three thousand nine hundred forty-one dollars and sixty-seven cents to Root Inc., three million or I'm sorry, three thousand two hundred two dollars and eight cents to Total Quality Logistics, twenty-five thousand nine hundred nineteen dollars and thirty-eight cents to Total System services $52,367.25 to U.S. Bank National Association $46,191.96 to Williams Lee Inc. and $31,650.41 to Woda Cooper Companies. Tax year 2021 is the first report year for Ofer Health Smile MD, and the payment to Root is for both uh, fiscal year, uh, reporting year 2020 and reporting year 2021 is Root Inc. because they missed the reporting cycle for the first year of their incentive term. Emergency action is requested so that the city can make payment in accordance with the Jobs Growth Incentive Program agreements. There is no emergency action requested tonight. Uh, Director Stevens, any additional de details you'd like to share on this ordinance? Uh, thank you, President Hardin, Vice Chair Ramey, members of Council. This is our annual payment based on our um, jobs growth incentives, which is a performance-based incentive. I will point out this is less this year than it was last year. We are seeing some impact from remote work. Um, so as we continue to move forward in our economic development efforts, we're really focusing on those um, jobs and, and opportunities where th they're in the office working in Columbus so we can continue to uh, benefit from the income tax. Thank you, Director Stevens. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? All right, seeing none, I amend to I move to amend to 30 days. Bye, boys. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bankston. Abstain. Ms. Burroughs Adi Padilla. Yeah. Ms. Brown. Yes. Mr. Dorans. Yes. Ms. Favor. Yes. Mr. Remy. Yes. President Harden. Yes. Or Mrs. Pat or removed yep. from the table. Amended. Amended. Next, I move to waive second reading. By voice. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bankston. Abstain. Ms. Barosa de Padilla. Yes. Ms. Brown. Yes. Mr. Dorans. Yes. Ms. Favor. Yes. Mr. Remy. Yes. President Hart. Yes. And finally, I move to pass. I move for passage as amended. By voice. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bankston. Abstain. Ms. Barosa de Padilla. Yes. Ms. Brown. Yes. Mr. Dorans. Yes. Ms. Favor. Mr. Remy? Yes. President Harden? Yes. Ordinance is passed. Thank you. I turn the floor back over to the chair. Thank, Thank you, you uh, Vice Chair Remy. The final ordinance, uh, Council President in Economic Development this evening, is Ordinance 2075 2022 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to dissolve the Job Creation Tax Credit Agreement with Designer Brands Inc., DSW Shoe Warehouse Inc., DSW Information Technologies LLC, DSW Leased Business Division LLC. Brand Card Services LLC and E Tail Direct LLC collective, uh, and to notify as necessary the local and state tax authorities and to declare an emergency. 
Uh, due to the impacts of the pandemic and other market pressures, DSW unfortunately will not hit the commitments necessary for them to retain their job creation tax credit. As a result, the agreement needs to be dissolved. That said, I do believe that this serves as a great learning opportunity since one of the most common questions that we receive uh, when economic development deals are passed is what mechanisms does the city have in place if the agreed upon metrics have not been met or are on track to meet their goals. Uh, Director Stevens, uh, could you just talk a little bit about disillusions generally uh, and the work that your uh, team put in uh, around this process? President Hardin, Chair Banks, and members of council, uh, not only on an annual basis do we do a tax incentive review council meeting where we make hold accountable those companies that make um, economic development deals with us to make sure they have made the investment and the job creation at the wage that they've committed to, but we also engage with businesses throughout the year to touch base and, and see where, what their progress is. And in this case, uh, working with DSW, we've identified that they weren't going to be able to meet their commitment, um, and so we decided to just proactively move this forward and have this dissolved. Uh, we do this a couple times a year, and a lot of it's going to result from our Tax Incentive Review Council meeting. The one we have scheduled this year is scheduled for August 19th. Um, so we will be back in September with an update on the results from that as well. Uh, thank you, Director. And again, just can't stress enough that uh, this is what happens, right? There are some organizations that perform well and in many cases exceed their metrics, uh, but we're watching them. And all of these tax incentives that we discussed that we weigh as a council, there's much thought gone into it. And I know that the narrative uh, is easy that these are just handouts, but really what they are is investments uh, in our people, investments in our infrastructure, uh, and they pay off in the long run. So our economic development strategy is working, although the easier narrative um, is sometimes out there. Uh, but we are also holding folks accountable, and that is what you see here in this legislation. Uh, any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa D. Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. And that is all I have this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The next committee to come before council is the Public Service and Transportation Committee, chaired by Councilmember Barosa D. Padilla. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. I have five ordinances today in Public Service and Transportation. The first is Ordinance 1745-2022 to amend the 2021 Capital Improvement Budget to authorize the transfer cash and appropriation of between projects within the general per permanent improvement fund and the streets and highways bond fund to appropriate the sum of $400,000 within the general permanent improvement fund to authorize the director of public service to execute a construction guaranteed maximum reimbursement agreement with the KIPP Columbus Foundation or a designated agent thereof to facilitate the construction of public infrastructure improvements associated with the expansion of the KIPP Columbus campus to authorize the expenditure of up to $400,000 from the General Permanent Improvement Fund to authorize the expenditures of, of up to $2 million from the Streets and Highways Bond Fund and to declare an emergency. The KIPP Columbus Foundation recently has undertaken an expansion project which will help culminate the construction of two academic buildings new academic buildings on the site to accommodate an additional 4,000 elementary students. This work will include public infrastructure improvements, specifically a new traffic signal and left turn lanes at the intersection of Agler Road and Wedge Drive in a shared use path along the side of Agler Road from the east of Bridge Walk Street to east of Inspire Drive. The Department of Public Service has agreed to reimburse all uh, for eligible construction costs incurred relative to the completion of the additional public infrastructure movements. Do you have any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa D. Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Uh, Ordinance 1784-2022 to authorize the city attorney to file complaints in order to immediately appropriate and accept the remaining fees, simple and lesser real estate necessary to timely complete the safety improvements, Maple Canyon Ave 
Sidewalks Project and to authorize the expenditure of $1,475 from the existing ACDI 001354. This ordinance will allow the city's acquisition of real estate, which will help make improve or repair certain portions of the public right-of-way of Maple Canyon Avenue from 161 to Jewett Drive. This ordinance is part of an overall project that will install everyone's favorite sidewalks along the side east side of Maple Canyon Avenue from the existing sidewalk install at the fire station to Jewett Drive. Do I have any questions or comments from my colleagues? Great, seeing that nice move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa, Di Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. 1960-2022 to amend the 2021 capital improvements budget to authorize and direct the city auditor to appropriate and transfer funds from the special income tax fund to the streets and highways bond fund to authorize the transfer of funds and appropriation within the streets and highways bond fund to appropriate funds within the streets and highways bond fund to authorize the director of public service to enter into contract with Strasser Paving Company um, incorporated for the resurfacing 2022 Project 2 to authorize the expenditure of up to $8,684,233.31 from the Streets and Highways Bond Fund for the project and to declare an emergency. So this is the second round of resurfacing. Um, we'll repair and resurface 71 city streets and construct 299 ADA curb ramps along those streets. And I believe on the map on the screen, we will have a map I know it's, it's, hard, it's hard to see, but I want to share the existence of said map um, where you can see where the resurfacing will be. And you can also see a list of street names that you can find on the city's website. So if you go to columbus.gov backslash public service, backslash, see, I'm, I'm just tempting you to go there, backslash public service, backslash streets, backslash resurfacing. I'm sure you could all just put that into Google and it'll lead you here where you can find the um, set of streets and where we will be installing curb ramps. Director Gallagher, anything you would add? Great. So folks can expect this construction to happen later this year. We're thinking around August. The construction will start. Perfect. So uh, do I have any questions or comments from my colleagues? Perfect. Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa, Di Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Uh, ordinance 2013-2022 to authorize the transfer of funds and appropriation within the Streets and Highways Bond Fund to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into contract with Complete General Construction Company for the North Market Streetscape Utility Relocation Design Project and to authorize the expenditure of up to $12,656,000 and 163, no, 12656 12, why can't I say this number? Twelve six five six one sixty three dollars and twenty three cents. Sorry, it's been a long day. From the Streets and Highways Bond Fund into the Development Taxable Bonds Fund for the project and to declare an emergency. So this contract consists mainly of utility relocation design projects, in addition to resurfacing, replacing sidewalks and streetlights, and other work is necessary in conjunction with the North Market Tower. So existing aerial facilities will be relocated underground on Vine Street, Spruce Street. Park Street, Swan Street, and improvements will also include the replacement of a water main and um, Armstrong and Park Street. So all of this construction will begin later this summer around the North Market. Do I have any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Borough City, Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Ordinance 1912 2022 to authorize the transfer of funds and appropriation within the Streets and Highways Bond Fund to appropriate funds within the Streets and Highways Non Bond Fund to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into a professional services contract with Wolpert for the Roadway North Knot. Uh, State Route 315 project to authorize the expenditure of up to $750,000, I promise I know numbers, from the Streets and Highways Bond Fund and the Streets and Highways Non-Bond Fund to pay for this contract and to declare an emergency. So this project will enhance the 315 at North Broadway, Olentangy River Road interchange and the surrounding area that will improve vehicular, bicycle and pedestrian access within the North Broadway and Olentangy River Road corridors to accommodate current and future development opportunities in the area. These opportunities um, include an opportunity to add a Link Us corridor, which will bring rapid transit to the area. 
Link Us will create an integrated mobility system that will make it easier to walk, bike, or take public transit in the region. It will increase access to jobs, schools, and healthcare for all families of the community, um, all members of the community, for seniors, veterans, people with disabilities, students, and working families to make the region more affordable and equitable for all. So um, this project will take place in multiple phases. It will make transportation easier, it will ease transportation around that area. It's literally called the not for a reason. So Director Gallagher, do you wanna give a little bit of context around this and what folks can expect? Yes, thank you. Yes, President Harden, um, Chair Brosa de Badia, and other members of council. So this legislation is the planning piece, and it is for the roadways um, and bridges west of Ohio State campus as they and other development expands um, west of the original campus. And it also includes State Route 315, which if you travel it, you know it's very congested from downtown to the north side of Columbus. So we are studying that whole area for future improvements. Um, we affectionately call it the North Knot because 315 kind of curves and is very circuitous through there. Um, and the Knot also includes Olentangy River Road, John Herrick Drive, Kinnear Road, Lane Avenue. It's that whole area throughout there. Um, and that travel through there is very difficult for motorists, bicyclists. Um, some of the roads don't have any pedestrian connection. And as um, our council chair said, um, for transit as we move forward, link us. So this legislation is also a commitment um, to show that we are moving forward with our Link Us Northwest Corridor um, and moving that towards implementation. As you know, Link Us does continue um, to move the region forward by bring, bringing rapid transit and other mobility options to the region. So this additional planning and design for the North Knot area is one of the implementation recommendations from the 2021 Northwest Corridor Mobility Study, which was one of the first pieces um, that the BRT Northwest Corridor came from. Um, so this, this project will help us then identify what long range improvements need to be. So we will in the future be coming to you asking um, to move forward some of those design elements then of course into construction. Um, so just thank you for the opportunity to kind of explain a little bit about this and, and we just ask for your passage. Thank you. Thank you, Director Gallagher. And there will be more to come about the knot. I'm not sure if it's affectionately called, that, but we'll take that. <laughs> um, are there any other questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing that, I move for passage. Second. Thanks, Dan Barosa de Padilla, Brown Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Thank you. May I move to my next committee? Thanks. Um, I have two ordinances today in neighborhoods, immigrant, refugee, and migrant affairs. The first is 2092-2022 to authorize the city clerk to enter into a grant agreement with mothers of murdered Columbus children in support of their community events, to authorize an appropriation and transfer within the general fund, and to authorize an expenditure within the general fund and to declare an, an emergency. Mothers of Murdered Columbus Children raises awareness about the rapid increase of crime resulting in murder in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, and supports collaborative action focused on crime prevention, outreach, and support services. Their community network puts on community events and neighborhood engagement sessions to help reduce gun violence. During these events, they share best practices for dealing with trauma and train new volunteers for their anti-violence network. Training modules include self-defense, de-escalation, soft-skill advocacy, trauma-informed practice, and strategies to interact with authority. During these events, they also work to foster positive relationships within the community and the Columbus Division of Police. Event examples include neighborhood block parties, vigils, after shooting incidences, community marches, and public health resource fairs. The founders and members of these organizations, of this organization, have turned their pain into action by helping to heal our community and reducing violence through their activism, community engagement, and education. Do you have any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown Dorans, Favor Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. Uh, ordinance 2140 2022 to authorize the city clerk to enter into contracts with the Ohio State University School of Social Work and Sky Nile Consulting for the creation of immigrant, refugee, and migrant town halls to authorize an appropriation expenditure of $150,000 within the Neighborhood Initiative Subfund and to declare an emergency. So we're very excited um, to start our process of uh, town halls that will engage the immigrant, refugee, and migrant communities. These will be 
focused town halls that will engage the communities about the opportunities and challenges that lay ahead that will really be the foundation and the ground, lay the groundwork for our work with these communities to expand access and to ensure that these communities thrive. Do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Great, I move to amend as submitted to the clerk by voice. Clerk, please call the roll by voice. Mr. Bankston. Abstain. Ms. Burroughs de Padilla. Yes. Ms. Brown. Yes. Mr. Dorans. Yes. Ms. Favor. Yes. Abstain. This is abstain. Abstain. <laughs> Mr. Remy. Yes. President Harden. Uh, yes. Amend it. And now I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Burroughs de Padilla, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you, and that is all for me this evening, Council President. Thank you, Madam Chair. The next committee coming before Council is the Finance Committee, chaired by President Pro Tem. President Pro Tem, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, President Harden. Um, uh, tonight in Finance, um, I will be starting with the bond package legislation. So on June 27th, we passed a series of resolutions declaring the necessity of placing the city's voted bond package proposal on the ballot for the November 8th election. Under the fiscal management of Auditor Kilgore and her staff, our city's debt portfolio has maintained a triple A rating, enabling us to make these requests of our residents for additional funds to invest into our neighborhoods. Before I read the resolutions, um, I will ask Deputy Director of Finance, Chris Long, um, if you could briefly describe the components of the package uh, and what, it is, what is included therein. President Harden, President Pro Tem Brown, members of council, uh, happy to talk about this bond sale package tonight. <clears throat> so these resolutions represent five different ordinances that are all part of one $1.5 billion voted bond package. These resolutions seek authority uh, to both create the ballot language uh, that will go in front of the electors this fall on November 8th, and it authorizes the city clerk to certify that uh, ballot language with the uh, Board of Elections. Okay, thank you so much. Um, as stated, um, there are five uh, resolutions coming up that we will, um, I will read each one and then move for passage. Before I move into the five sections, I'm going to pause for any questions from my colleagues, um, for the director or of course, Auditor Kilgore can chime in if anything is about the mechanics. All right. Um, starting with resolution 128X-2022 to determine to proceed with the issue of bonds and certifying same to the Board of Elections in the amount of $300 million for health, safety, and infrastructure and to declare an emergency. I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa D. Padilla, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Resolution 129X-2022 to determine to proceed with the issues of bonds and certifying same to the Board of Elections in the amount of $200 million for recreation and parks and to declare an emergency. I move for passage. Second. Clerk, let's call the roll. Or adoption. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Adopted. Thank you. Resolution 130X-2022 to determine to proceed with the issue of bonds and certifying same to the Board of Elections in the amount of $200 million for neighborhood development and to declare an emergency. I move for adoption. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Adopt it. Resolution 131X-2022 to determine to proceed with the issue of bonds and certifying same to the Board of Elections in the amount of $250 million for public service and to declare an emergency. I move for adoption. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Adopt it. Resolution 132X-2022 to determine to proceed with the issue of bonds and certifying same to the Board of Elections in the amount of $550 million for water, power, sanitary sewers, and storm sewers, and to declare an emergency. I move for adoption. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Adopt it. Thank you so much. Um, next in finance, we have Ordinance 1637-2022 to authorize the Director of Finance and Management to submit the third substantial amendment to the city's 2020 annual action plan in order to allocate $4,068,840 of CDBGCV funds across seven projects 
to appropriate $4,068,840 in funds received from HUD for the CDBGCV program to authorize the Director of Finance and Management to enter into a sub-award agreement with Sanctuary Night in the amount of $100,000, and to authorize the Director of Finance and Management to modify the existing sub-award with Capital Crossroads Special Improvement District to increase the budget by $403,635 and to declare an emergency. This legislation authorizes a third substantial amendment to be submitted to HUD um, in order to reallocate uh, that approximate $4 million of CDBGCV funds that will prevent, prepare for, and respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and authorizes the expenditure of $403,635 of CDBGCV funds um, to Capital Crossroads and 100 to Sanctuary Night. Uh, Deputy Director Chris Long, is there anything you would like to share about the process for these funding allocations that Council should know? President Harden, President Perton Brown, members of Council, uh, yes, this ordinance just seeks the ability to reallocate approximately $4.1 million of CDBG CV dollars. As you stated, President Pro Tem, these dollars are specifically to address the COVID-19 pandemic in our community, but they have certain timeliness spend down requirements. 80% of these dollars should be spent down by July of next year. And as such, this is a request to reallocate the dollars towards projects that are more shovel ready and that uh, directly address the impact on our community. So they're just a better fit for these dollars. Thank you so much, Deputy Director, and thank you to your team. I know they've worked very hard. These um, federal funds, um, CDBG dollars, come with a lot of work internally to make sure um, that, they're, that they're done correctly and to abide by um, what the, the feds request of us. Any questions? Uh, seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bangston, Barroso, Sadi Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor. Remy, President Harden. Pass. Next, we have Ordinance 1767-2022 to authorize the Finance and Management Director to establish various purchase orders for fuel and fueling services on behalf of the Fleet Management Division per the terms and conditions of various previously established universal term contracts to authorize the expenditure of $2,100,000 from the Fleet Management Operating Fund. Uh, due to increasing prices to date, the city is projecting to utilize the entire fuel budget this year with no carryover. For this reason, this legislation plus additional legislation that will come uh, next week is required to further support our fleet operation. Any questions? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barroso de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor. Remy, President Hart. Pass. Uh, thank you. And then actually from the last ordinance in my committee, could we turn back to page 14 in the consent agenda, ordinance 2029-2022, to authorize the city treasurer to modify its contract with U.S. Bank N.A. for gift cards for the Department of Public Safety, Division of Police, and to authorize the expenditure of up to $10,000 from the contraband seizure fund. And I will actually turn this ordinance over to Chair of Public Safety, Councilmember Remy, uh, to say a few words um, and uh, move for passage if he deems so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair Brown. Um, just uh, on J June 24, 2022, the Department of Public Safety Division of Police requested um, to obtain gift cards for an event at Red, White, and Boom. Chief Bryant created a teen zone for the event to offer activities and opportunity to win prizes. Funding of $10,000 will be provided by contraband seizure fund dollars. The city treasurer office now wishes to modify its contract with U.S. Bank to obtain those gift cards. I just want to begin by thanking um, Chief Bryant, the Division of Police, for continuing to develop creative methods of engaging our local youth. It's critical, especially during today's climate, for our police officers to build positive relationships with our youth, including our at youth our at risk youth. The teen zone provided an opportunity for teens attending Red, White, and Boom to hang out with officers and play games, enjoy food and beverages, win prizes, and receive gift cards. I believe this was an amazing way for Columbus City Council to exercise our legislative authority to utilize seizure funds for the purchase of gift cards. This was both a creative and forward-thinking way of protecting our teens during one of the city's largest annual events. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues this evening? C Council President Harden. I would just like to second your appreciation for um, the police chief. I stopped by the games at the Fair White and Boom and 
Um, the police got their butts kicked, but fire held strong for us against the teens out there. Um, but the relationship building is serious. It's real. I think it's what builds um, community between our safety forces and, and our residents. Um, and they're being very intentional. And so I think this is a great use of uh, city dollars, or, or even better use of seizure funds. So thank Absolutely. you. All right. Any other questions or comments this evening? Thank you. If none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa, Di Padilla, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Pass it back to Chair Brown. Thank you so much, Council Member, and that is all I have in my committee. Thank you, Council Madam President. Chair. Uh, the next committee to come before Council is the Public Utilities Committee, chaired by Council Member Dorans. Council Member, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President and the Public Utilities. We have Ordinance 1809-2022 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to renew and increase the Professional Engineering Services Agreement with Arcadis U.S. Inc. for the Parsons Avenue water plant lines laker and soda ash feeder replacement project for the division of water to authorize the transfer and appropriation of expenditure of up to one million two hundred forty three thousand five hundred dollars within the water paygo fund and to amend the 2021 capital improvement budget um, this project is necessary to upgrade chemical feed systems and the infrastructure of the parsons avenue water plant uh, which is one of our essential components of our water supply here in central ohio um, the current consultant is familiar with the project and has completed all the work to date on the current design path, so bidding the work to another consultant would result in delays and higher costs due to bringing the new consultant up to speed on the project and put the city at risk of not meeting its water treatment goals. Uh, do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Bankston, Barosa Di Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you, Council President. That's all I have at these committees tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next committee coming before Council is the Housing Committee, chaired by Councilmember Favor. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President Harden. Tonight in Housing Committee, we have Ordinance 1839-2022 to amend the 2021 Capital Improvement Budget to authorize the City Auditor to transfer funds within the Affordable Housing Bond Fund and the Development Taxable Bond Fund to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into a Housing Development Agreement and a Grant Agreement in an amount up to $1 million with National Church Residences for the Clover Glen Project to authorize an expenditure of up to $500,000 from the Affordable Housing Bond and $500,000 from the Development Taxable Bond Fund and to declare an emergency. Clover Glen serves the unique and growing aging, low-income population in Ohio. The senior housing community will offer 92 one-bedroom units with approximately 20 units affordable to residents at or below 30% of the area median income and 72 units affordable to residents at 60% of the area median income. This housing development agreement would memorialize the city's desired commitment to the project and con con contribute $2.9 million of bond funds over two years, $1 million from the 2021 capital budget and $1.9 million from the 2022 capital budget. Are there any questions or comments by my colleagues? Seeing none, I'd move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa Di Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. May I move on to criminal justice and judiciary? Sure. My apologies. No, you're good. And criminal justice and judiciary, we have ordinance 2124 to authorize the city attorney to settle the case of Catherine Joseph v. City of Columbus et al. pending before the Ohio Civil Rights Commission to authorize, the direct, authorize and direct the city auditor to transfer $80,000 within the Health Special Revenue Fund 2250 to authorize the expenditure of $80,000 from the Health Special Revenue Fund in payment of the settlement and to declare an emergency. This ordinance is submitted to settle the charge of discrimination filed by Catherine Joseph versus the City of Columbus alleging disability <coughs> discrimination with the Ohio Civil Rights Commission in the amount of $80,000. I see that we have um, Assistant City Attorney 
Laura Baker Morris, which I know that is not the official title. I, I apologize. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ms. Uh, Baker Morris, do you have any additional comments to make at this time? Uh, thank you, Council Member Favor. I just wanted to indicate uh, that this particular settlement resulted out of a claim that was filed at the Ohio Civil Rights Commission, as was mentioned during the introductions. Um, it is the city attorney's uh, position that this would be the best resolution of this particular action. Um, Catherine Joseph was employed by or is employed by the Columbus Public Health as a public health program manager, too, and as a nurse. Uh, Ms. Joseph was originally hired in September 2019 as a manager in the immunization clinic. In early 2020, the department began to become aware of difficulties or concerns between Ms. Joseph and the staff she supervised. And in September of 2020, she was charged with operating a motor vehicle under the influence and did not promptly report to the department. Um, there were some uh, issues that arose between her and her employer during that period of time. And ultimately, Ms. Joseph filed the charge of discrimination regarding her various moves within the department, alleging a disability discrimination. It is the city's position that Ms. Joseph's reassignments that occurred during that time were justified and appropriate. However, the department seeks finality with regard to Ms. Joseph's allegations against the department. To resolve these matters, along with any remaining matters through the date of settlement, the department has offered and Ms. Joseph has accepted the amount of $80,000 less applicable taxes and withholdings. Ms. Joseph has agreed to voluntarily resign as part of the settlement with her salary and benefits totaling over $100,000 annually. Protracted litigation could have proven costly. The funds to pay for the settlement will come from the department's HR operating fund and the settlement will release the city of Columbus from any and all claims arising out of Ms. Joseph's employment as of the effective date of the settlement agreement. Thank you. Are there any additional questions or comments uh, for the city attorney's office? Mm -hmm. With that, I'd move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa, De Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, President Hart. Pass. Thank you. Should I stop now? Yeah, we'll have a motion to uh, recess. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa, De Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, President Hart. In recess. Five minutes, we'll start.
on rezoning or council variance, we will only hear a staff presentation for ordinances that have disapproval from our recommending body, or we have a public speaker who signed up against an ordinance. We have received one public speaker slip this evening uh, in favor of an ordinance. However, that individual has uh, let staff know that he's uh, only here to ask our um, answer questions if council members have them. Uh, all speakers and council variances, including city staff, area commissions, uh, applicants and members of the public will be sworn in before they give testimony. Um, representatives of an area commission and applicants are always able to speak on an ordinance and, will, and do not need to fill out a speaker slip. On the advice of the city attorney, I will now swear in city staff. Please stand and raise your right hand and be sworn in. Um, do you swear or affirm that testimony you're about to give shall be the truth and nothing but the truth that you shall answer the pains or penalties of perjury? If so, please say I do. Thank you. Please let the record show that Shannon Pine for the Department of Building and Zoning Services and Brandon Hayes, the Department of Public Service, have been sworn in. Um, moving to the rezonings and amendments tonight, we have Ordinance 1974 2022 to rezone 199 Franklin Avenue, being 0.90 plus acres located primarily in the southwest corner of Franklin Avenue and Sherman Avenue from CPD Commercial Plan Development District and R3 Residential District to CPD Commercial Plan Development District. The applicant is 1199 Franklin Investments, LLC, care of Dave Perry agent. Proposed use is a commercial development. City's Department recommendations approval. The Development Commission's recommendation is approval 5-0. The Near East Area Commission's recommendation is approval 10-01. Uh, do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I first move to amend as submitted to the clerk. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Thank you. And now I move to, uh, I move for passage as amended. Second. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Next we have uh, Ordinance 2003-2022 uh, uh, to rezone 2270 Williams Road being 6.24 plus acres located on the north side of Williams Road, 500 plus feet, um, feet west of Allen Creek Drive from C2 Commercial District and LM2 Limited Manufacturing District to LM2 Limited Manufacturing District. Um, the applicant is Brad Woltz, 868 Partners LLC, care of Dave Hodge, attorney, the proposed use of the warehouse and office. Seas Department recommendation is approval. Development Commission is, approval is 5-1. Far South Area Commission's recommendation is approval 11-0. Do I my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Bankston, Burroughs, Adi Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Thank you. Uh, moving to the Council Variances, we have Variance 1827-2022 to grant a variance provisions of sections. Um, sorry, my computer changed there for a second. Sorry. To grant a variance provisions of section 3332.03 R1 Residential District and 3312.49C, minimum numbers parking spaces required of the Columbus City Coast, the property located at 2859 Innis Road to permit a shared uh, living facility and parking of a uh, food truck with reduced development parking. Uh, with reduced parking in the R1 residential district and repeal ordinance number 1329-96 uh, passed on July 15th, 1996. Uh, the applicant is Teen Challenge for Girls Incorporated, care of Mark Denny Agent. Proposed use is a shared living uh, expansion. The city's department recommendation is approval. The Northeast Area Commission recommendation is approval. Uh, again, we had one speaker signed up to speak in favor of this project tonight. Uh, so I'll pause and see if any council members have any questions. Seeing none, uh, I first move to accept the entire staff report into evidence as an exhibit. Okay. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Next, I move to adopt the findings of staff as the findings of council. Okay. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. And finally, I move for passage. Okay. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Thank you. Next, we have variance 1970-2022 to grant a variance of provisions of section 3356.03C4 permitted uses 3370.05 permitted uses 3312.21AB landscaping and screening 3312.49 minimum number of parking spaces required and 3321.078 landscaping 3356.11C4 district setback lines and 3370.07 condition limitations of the Columbus City Codes the property located at 4025 South High Street to permit a um, multi unit residential development with reduced development standards in the LC4 limited commercial district. The applicant is LDG multifamily LLC care of Laura McGregor comic attorney the proposed use of a multi-unit residential development city's department's recommendation is approval the far south area commission's recommendation is approval 11-0. Do I make colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none I move to accept the entire staff report and evidence as an exhibit. 
Bangston, Barossa, DePadilla, mm -hmm. Brown, Torrance, Favor, Remy, President Hart. Accept it. Next, I move to adopt the findings of staff and the findings of council. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa D. Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hard. Adopt it. And finally, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa D. Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hard. Passed. And finally, we have variance 2000 2022 to grant a variance provisions of section 3363.01 and manufacturing district 3309.14A height districts, 3312.49 minimum number of parking spaces required, 3363.24 billing lines in and manufacturing district, and 3372.704 ABCD setback requirements of the Columbus City Codes for the property located at 30 Fornoff Road permit a mixed-use development with a reduced development standards in the M Manufacturing District. The applicant is NRP uh, Properties, LLC, care of Dave Perry Agent. The proposed use is a mixed-use development. City's Department recommendation is approval. The Far South Area Commission's recommendation is approval 11 0 Do I have my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move to accept the entire staff report into evidence as an exhibit. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Accept it. I now move to adopt the findings of staff as the findings of council. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Adopt it. And finally, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Passed. Next, we have variance 2004-2022 to grant a variance provisions of section 3311.28A, less objectionable uses, 3312.25 maneuvering, 3312.39 stripping and marking, 3312.43 required surface for parking, 3312.49 MIM number of parking spaces required, 3367.15E, and manufacturing district special provisions, and 3367.29B storage of the Columbus City Coast, the property located at 2270 Williams. Road to permit a reduced uh, development standards for warehouse and office uses in the LM2 Limited Manufacturing District. The applicant is Brad Waltz, 868 Partners LLC, care of Dave Hodge, attorney. Proposed use is warehouse and office. City's Department recommendation is approval. The Far South Area Commission's recommendation is approval 11 0. Do I have my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move to accept the entire staff report and do evidence as an exhibit. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa D. Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Accept it. Thank you. I now move to adopt the findings of staff as the findings of council. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Adopt it. And finally, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Pass. Thank you, Council President. That is all we have in tonight's zoning agenda. Nice. Is there see no further business coming for zoning? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Meeting is adjourned. Give time for the directors. We'll get in. You are ready.
Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. We are back in meeting 35. The next committee coming for Council of the Health and Human Services Committee, chaired by Councilmember Favor. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you. Tonight in Health and Human Services Committee, we have Ordinance 1698-2022 that authorizes the amendment of Ordinance 3026-2021, passed by City of Col City Council on December 6, 2020. Is that right? Okay, on December 6, 2022 and 2021, and the appropriation and expenditure of an additional $240,624 of the fiscal year 2022 Emergency Solutions Grant ESG from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for the Department of Development to authorize expenses beginning June 1, 2022, and to declare an emergency. This ordinance authorizes the amendment of Ordinance 30. 26 2021 passed by city council in 2021 after the city is awards forum hud was known the department of development is modifying this agreement to add additional funds of two hundred forty thousand six hundred twenty four dollars this ordinance will authorize the appropriation and expenditure of the additional funds i would like to remove this from the table thanks to barosa de padilla brown oh i apologize that's a voice vote mr baxton i apologize my voice, my bad. Uh, abstain. Ms. Barosa de Padilla? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorns? Yes. Ms. Favor? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. President Hart? Yes. Thank you. Now I'd move to amend as submitted to the clerk by voice. Clerk, please call the roll by voice. Mr. Bankston? Abstain. Ms. Barosa de Padilla? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorns? Yes. Ms. Favor? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. President Hart? Yes. Removed. Thank you. And now I would move for passage as amended by voice. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bankston? Abstain. Ms. Barosa de Padilla? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorans? Yes. Ms. Faber? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. President Hart? Yes. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 2070 2022 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into beneficiary agreements with numerous social service agencies using Federal Amer American Rescue Plan Act or ARPA funds to support and increase the organizational capacity of nonprofit organizations that experience revenue losses such as canceled fundraising events, decreases in donor support, and increased expenditures such as PPE virtual meeting licenses, and related hardware caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. To authorize the Director of the Dep Development to enter, excuse me, to modify the terms and conditions of the beneficiary agreements as needed without seeking further City Council approval in order to align with the most current versions of laws, regulations, and guidance. To authorize the expenditure of up to $4.6 million of ARPA funds and to declare an emergency. These this ordinance authorizes the director of the Department of Development to award funds to 45 social service agencies using Federal American Rescue Plan Act funds in the amount of $4.6 million. These organizations were selected through the city's competitive Elevate grant program and will receive ARPA funding to increase the organizational capacity of agencies working on one or more of the following focus areas, increasing infant vitality, reducing unsheltered homelessness, or increasing housing stability among immigrant and refugee households. Are there any questions or comments at this time from my colleagues? Seeing none, I'd move for passage. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 2083-2022 to authorize a Director of Development to enter into beneficiary agreements with Young Women's Christian Association in an amount up to $150,000 and Community Refugee and immigra Immigration Services in an amount up to $150,000 using Federal American Rescue Plan Act funds to support and increase the organizational capacity of nonprofit organizations that experience revenue losses such as canceled fundraising events, decreases in donor support, and increased expenditures such as PPE, virtual meeting licenses, and related hardware caused by COVID-19 pandemic. To authorize the Director of Development to modify the terms and conditions of the beneficiary agreements as needed without seeking further City Council approval in order to align with the most current versions of the law, 
regulations, and guidance to authorize an expenditure of up to $300,000 of ARPA funds and to declare an emergency. YWCA of Columbus continues to provide emergency shelter and wraparound services to homeless individuals in our community. Chris has been a great community partner working to increase housing stability for immigrant refugee households throughout the pandemic. Shelter staff work tirelessly to provide in-person assistance to residents experiencing housing instability. By doing so, they put the health and well-being of themselves and their families at risk to keep our neighbors housed. This ordinance will support the YWCA with funding for operational support to implement COVID-19 prevention and mitigation tactics, remodeling of some spaces to improve infection control measures, and hiring additional temporary staff to cover staffing needs. Are there any questions or comments by my colleagues at this time? Seeing none, I'd move for passage. By voice. Mr. Bankston? Yes. Ms. Burrows de Padilla? Yes. Ms. Brown? Mr. Dorans? Yes. Ms. Faber? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. President Harden? Yes. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 2084-2022 to authorize the Director of Department of Development to, in to enter into a beneficiary agreement with Dress for Success Columbus in an amount up to $100,000 using Federal American Rescue Plan dollars. Federal American Rescue Plan Act funds to support and increase the organizational capacity of nonprofit organizations that experience revenue losses such as canceled event, canceled fundraising events, decreases in donor support, and increased expenditures such as PPE, virtual meeting licenses, and related hardware caused by COVID-19 pandemic to authorize the Director of Development to modify the terms and conditions of the beneficiary agreement as needed without seeking further city council approval in order to align with the most current versions of the laws, regulations, and guidance to authorize the expenditure of up to $100,000 of ARPA funds and to declare an emergency. This legislation authorizes the director of the Department of Development to allocate dollars using federal ARPA funds to address for success Columbus in an amount up to $100,000 to support and increase their organizational capacity. I am proud that our city has prioritized strengthening families by investing $5 million of City of Columbus ARPA funds to increase organizational capacity of nonprofit organizations that tackled homelessness, infant mortality rates, and increasing housing stability for immigrant and re refugee households. These focus areas are critical to ensuring a prosperous future for all Columbus families, but it is important to also acknowledge the racial disparities that continue to exist. In 2020, Mayor Ginther created the Recovery and Resiliency Committee in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And in their final report, housing was indicated as the most critical need to stabilize communities in crisis. The report shares that approximately 54,000 low, low and moderate income households in Franklin County paid more than half of their income to housing costs. And among those households, 55% of them were black households a major racial disparity since the overall population of black residents in Franklin County is only 24%. And these numbers were before the pandemic. And for mortality rates, which is also inextricably linked to housing, remain alarmingly high for black babies in Franklin County. And the disparate racial impact is also reflected in Franklin County's homeless population. The reality is that the pandemic has and will continue to have a major impact on the health and well-being of many vulnerable groups in our city, and the future of our city depends on ensuring all residents have the means and opportunity to thrive in safe and stable environments. That is why we must continue to be intentional with our funding and support. The Elevate funding will allow us to support our partners working to serve the most vulnerable among us and will have an incalculable impact on our city. The Elevate Great Dollars are necessary and important step for our city, and I want to extend my sincere gratitude to the mayor and to the Department of Development for prioritizing these ARPA dollars to, support, to provide support to our human service organizations. Are there any, well, I'm, I apologize, Director Stevens, do you have anything you'd like to add at this time? President Hardin, Chair Favor, members of council, I just want to thank you for your support on this important work. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite um, the Chief Executive Officer of Jewish Family Services, Ms. Karen B. Mosner, to the podium. Thank you for being here this evening.
Thank you, Council Member Favor and other members of Council, uh, Council President Hardin, um, for the opportunity to speak about the impact that this Elevate funding uh, will have in our community. For Jewish Family Services, the funding will help us provide um, incre or increase housing stability for immigrants and refugees in our community. And Immigrant and Refugee Services has been an essential part of our agency's work since we were founded in 1908. Um, originally, that was to help Jewish refugees and immigrants who were building a home and community in central Ohio. And since that time, we've done the same for immigrants and refugees of many faiths and cultures and from countries all over the world. Much of that, of our work, uh, with those communities has taken the form of workforce development, <clears throat> helping refugees and other new Americans find employment, and helping companies tap into this hidden workforce. The Elevate grant will fill a gap in our funding. It will enable us to address one of the biggest challenges facing our new American neighbors, and that is housing stability. So I thought the best way to illustrate the impact of this grant would be to share the story of one of our um, newer clients. His name is Mohammed. He's a 21-year-old refugee from Iraq. Mohammed was first resettled in the United States just last December, so only seven months ago. He was initially resettled in another state, but um, a few months after a few months there, he relocated to Columbus because of the strong Iraqi community here and the opportunities here. His mother came with him. She was experiencing significant health issues. When he arrived in Columbus, he no longer had access to financial support that comes with resettlement because that funding doesn't follow refugees when they move to another state. So he had virtually no English language skills, very limited formal education after spending years in a refugee camp, no car, he was providing care for his mother. So as you might imagine, this made employment very difficult and without employment, his housing situation was extremely precarious. He came to us just a couple of weeks ago after receiving an eviction notice. And the kind of help he needs is exactly what this Elevate grant will enable us to provide for Mohammed and others. It enables us to work directly with his landlord to build understanding and to bridge cultural and language gaps to negotiate solutions and to prevent or at least delay a loss of housing. It enables us to provide emergency financial assistance, to connect individuals like Mohammed and his mother with additional resources and other community supports that will help them stabilize and access transportation, health care, and meet their other needs. And it will assist immigrants and refugees like Mohammed with language acquisition and training that will enable him to obtain employment. So with the increased capacity for organizations like ours to provide these kinds of supports, we can help Mohammed and others, other community members like him, find and maintain employment. And in our current environment, that means entry-level jobs at wages of $19 an hour and up into the low to mid $20 an hour, even for individuals who speak little or no English. Um, so that's just as a, as a start for their stability. So this kind of funding will enable us to continue offering supports for clients like Mohammed so he can achieve his goals of a next better job, of English as a second language, and higher education, and a career. Mohammed is interested in becoming a civil engineer. Um, so one of, he may be working for one of your departments in a few years, we hope. Um, as you know, New Americans play a critical and significant role in the life and the economic health of Columbus and Central Ohio and generate billions of dollars a year in economic impact. So this funding will help Mohammed and others like him be able to become productive, contributing members of our community, strengthening and enriching our city and Central Ohio. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for taking time uh, to be down here. And more importantly, uh, thank you for the work that you continue to do uh, on behalf of our residents every single day, continuing to serve them. And um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank all of our human service organizations across this city 
for your continued resilience, your hard work, and your strength over these past uh, few years. Are there any questions or comments by my colleagues? Seeing none, I'd move for passage. Mr. Bankston. Abstain. Ms. Barosa de Padilla. Yes. Ms. Brown. Yes. Mr. Dorans. Yes. Ms. Favor. Yes. Mr. Remy. Yes. President Harden. Yes. Thank you, Council President. The first five ordinances are all related and are resolutions to withdraw the liquor permit renewal objections for five Columbus businesses who have satisfied their nuisance abatement agreements. I am now going to ask uh, City At Assistant Attorney Sarah Pomeroy, who will provide additional background on these withdrawals, to come to the podium. Welcome. Thank Sarah, you so much. Closures. Thank you so much, Chair, Council President Hardin, Pro Tem uh, Brown, members of Council, appreciate uh, you allowing me to speak to you tonight. Uh, as most of you know, I handle the liquor uh, permit objections for the city, and inherent in that work is a year-round process of working with city departments, community members, and business owners to ensure that our liquor per permitted establishments are safe for the community. Uh, in November, I presented the city's 20 objections to, to you all. Um, and since then, I've been working with each of these establishments uh, to address concerns, to make safety and security uplifts at the properties. Um, we resolve many of these objections via agreements that govern these operations at the premises, which are then subsequently filed in environmental court in Franklin County. Uh, and therefore, with the filing of that agreement, the objections can then be withdrawn. Uh, there are two methods by which the city can withdraw an objection. Uh, the first is that the Division of Liquor Control can effectively hold a hearing where the city presents the agreement and no further evidence, and then the objection is overruled by the Division of Liquor Control. Um, the other option is that council actually passes a subsequent resolution withdrawing the objection, so effectively the reverse of what we did uh, back in November. Uh, usually in the past, we've primarily done that first option where we've held a short hearing, basically saying the parties have worked it out, we're confident about you know, operations moving forward, and the division overrules the city. Um, so on paper, it's an overrule, even if ultimately, I think all parties would consider that to be a win-win, uh, you know, continued operation plus accountability measures. Um, this year, however, the Division of Liquor Control actually specifically requested that the City of Columbus formally withdraw uh, its renewal objections, and uh, ultimately, uh, certainly the City Attorney's Office agrees that a formal withdrawal is the best way to adequately reflect the resolution that's reached with e each business. An overrule on paper doesn't show that we did have good cause to object, uh, nor does it show that we actually did work with the business to come up with a safety plan to meet with them, their ownership, with police, with community members, so on and so forth. Um, thus, renewal objections passed via resolution in the fall to be withdrawn would need to be uh, withdrawn via resolution, and that's why I'm here tonight. The five withdrawals before you represent five businesses that have met with the city, engaged in fruitful discussions about safety and their place in the surrounding community, uh, and entered into resolutions that then guard against, hopefully, ever having to be back in front of you all again. Um, as many of you know, it's very rare for us to return uh, with uh, you know, businesses that we've reached agreements with. Uh, it does happen, but, um, but usually this sets up you know, the location for success in the future. Uh, and so the locations basically before you, and one of the reasons we're asking for an, this on an emergency basis, have been operating basically under the goodwill between the city and the division. They're not actually issued a new permit. We typically will not oppose their operation while we are trying to work things out. But it is very much in these businesses' best interests and, frankly, the communities for the objections to be withdrawn as soon as, as practicable. Um, and therefore, the agreement can go into full effect. The city holds up its end of the bargain. They hopefully hold up theirs. Um, I'm happy to take questions about each of these five locations. Uh, as you know, many of our, uh, we've got more than just five, um, so I can answer questions generally about the process, but these are the five that we have before you today, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Ms. Pomeroy, anybody have any questions in regards to these five 
pieces of legislation. I just want to thank you for your ongoing efforts at collaboration and trying to work through this process with each individual. It's a it, probably a labor of love uh, for you, and, and certainly we um, appreciate you working through that. Um, I was going to say this is the first time in my four and a half years that I remember us withdrawing, but understanding the process a little bit better, um, this makes a lot more sense, and so we're, we're happy to support you and the work that you've done, and just uh, owe you a lot of thanks for that. Thank you so much. All right. All right, then I will begin with Ordinance 152X 2022 to withdraw the objection to the renewal of liquor permit number 2412996010 held by East Stop I Inc. doing business as Convenient Plus Food Mart located at 3351 East Main Street, Columbus, Ohio 43213 and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa, De Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Next, I have Ordinance 0153X 2022 to withdraw the objection to the renewal of liquor permit number 5077469, held by Lena Food Inc., doing business as Weber Road Market, located at 900 East Weber Road, Columbus, Ohio, 43211, and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Next, I have Ordinance 0154X 2022 to withdraw the objection to the renewal of liquor permit number 2097745 held by East Destination 2 Success LLC, doing business as Beverage Warehouse located at 847 East 11th Avenue, Columbus, Ohio, 43211, and to declare an emergency. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Next, I have Z Ordinance 0155X 2022 to withdraw the objection to the renewal of liquor permit number 2848547, eight held by 4027 Thirsty Drive Through Inc., doing business as Thirsty Drive Through, located at 4027 Livingston Avenue, Columbus, Ohio, 43227, and to declare an emergency. Are there any questions or comments <laughs> from my colleagues? <laughs> I move for adoption. Clerk, please call the row. Bankston, Barossa, D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Next, I have Ordinance 0156X 2022 to withdraw the objection to the renewal of liquor permit number 648-394-40006, held by ROB Enterprises, Inc., doing business as Marathon Westland Shell Car Wash, located at 2805 West Broad Street, Columbus, Ohio, 43204, and to declare an emergency. Are there any questions or comments? From my colleagues. Seeing none, I move for adoption. Clerk, please call the row. Bankston, Barossa D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. And finally, I have ordinance 1949 2022 to authorize the finance and management director to associate all general budget reservations resulting from this ordinance with Goals LLC and HICOM for the purchase of uniforms and accessories for the Division of Police from existing universal term contracts to authorize the expenditure of $3,166 thousand two hundred eighty dollars from the general fund and to declare an emergency the division of police needs to procure uniforms footwear leather goods uniform accessories and protective wear for police officers recruits and some civilian employees this ordinance will enable the division to purchase these uniforms from goals llc and HICOM in accordance with the universal term contracts established for the purpose of the for this purpose by the purchasing office are there any questions or comments from my colleagues Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa, D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you, Council President. That is all I have this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The final committee to come before Council is the Rules and Reference Committee. In the committee, we have Ordinance 2027-2022 to amend Chapter 329 of the Columbus City Codes in order to better implement the construction manager at risk procurement method and to declare an emergency. In December 2021, Council passed Ordinance 2605-2021, implementing changes to Chapter 329 to create the Construction Management at Risk Delivery Method for Construction Procurement. The purpose of tonight's uh, ordinance is to clarify portions of the Chapter 329 to ensure that any CMR that plans to self-perform that construction work is pre-qualified responsible or pre-qualified provisionally responsible. Additionally, the CMR uh, procurement method will be limited to projects estimated to cost more than $2 million. Are there any questions or comments? 
Seeing none, uh, is there a motion to pass? Second. Clerk, please call the roll. And just joking. Uh, yeah, first I move to pass uh, add an amendment. Thank you. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barroso, D. Padilla, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Amended. Now is there a motion to approve? Yes, submitted. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barroso, D. Padilla, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. See no further business coming for council. Is there a motion to adjourn? Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barroso, D. Padilla, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Harden.